The myths and risks of participating in research. There are many myths and most of them are exactly that myths. Um, there are people who think that they have to change what they're on or what they're doing in terms of their medications or their therapists that they see or things like that. that that's not the point of participating in research and, and people don't have to do that. The, the point is for people to stay stable. So if you're on a medicine for cholesterol, for example, we want you to stay on that. We don't want you to come off the cholesterol medicine just to participate in the clinical trial. We want things to stay the same and so that if we have a group that's as stable as can be and they get an intervention and we compare it to another group that's as stable as can be and they get the placebo, then if something happens in the group that got the intervention, we know what that is. Whether it's a safety issue or an efficacy issue, we can see what the difference is. And so that's why we want people just stable. Now there are specific entry criteria so if we're looking at a drug that treats chorea, we want people to have chorea. We don't want them to be presymptomatic, for example. It wouldn't be appropriate in that situation for that study, for that goal of that study. And having a very specific question to answer and address is important for every research study. And that's part of the role of the Institutional Review Board, or IRB, is to make sure that we're not just doing research for fun, that there's actually a purpose, that there's a scientific question to be answered there. And these independent institutional review boards, or IRBs, they make sure that we're doing this for the right reasons. They are also independent and not paid by the study in any way. Um, and so they have no type of uh, uh, say or stake in the outcome of any study. They just want to make sure that we're answering a good question and that the benefits outweigh the potential risks. Because anytime you participate in research, there are risks. Um, whether it's uh, confidentiality or the risk of a medication or if it's a physical therapy trial, the risk of a fall. So th there are risks and we understand that, but the, benefit, the potential benefits that are there have to outweigh. And that's also part of the informed consent process. So the informed consent process is exactly that. It's not a document. I'm not going to hand someone a 42 page document and say, sign this, let's get started. And it's also, I'm not going to hand them the document and say, read it. If you have any questions, let me know. We'll all sign it and then we'll get going. That's just documentation that we've talked about things. And the, the, we have many decades of experience and laws and evolution from an ethics standpoint to make sure the people that participating in trials understand what it's about, what are the possible benefits, what are the possible risks, what are the alternatives, what are the standards that are out there, what happens in terms of confidentiality and, and if you get injured in the course of the clinical trial. So those are all different pieces of the conversation that goes on to make sure you understand what's happening before you participate in clinical trials. It's also not a contract. When you sign that informed consent form, it's not saying I will finish this out no matter what, no matter what's happening to me. Now, we obviously prefer that people if there's a three-month trial and you know it's going to require a visit every other week, that's a, that might be a lot for some people, but we also hope that knowing that in advance that you'll be able to follow through. So if it turns out something happens and you can't, it's a voluntary thing. We always get people to volunteer for research. It's never mandated. And by that same token, physicians can recommend that you think about and talk about it, but they can't make you participate. And they're also not going to change their clinical care based on whether you participate in research or not. It's completely independent. Those are two different pathways. I think for uh, providers, um, uh, primary care providers, sometimes in other healthcare systems, for example, um, I know in California we have a lot of managed care. And for those kinds of markets, um, sometimes patients don't have the freedom to move about as much as they want to. They may not be able to pick their primary care physician or pick the medical group that they are uh, receiving their care from, but they certainly can still participate in the clinical trial at our center. And so that's a huge benefit. They can still come and get that help. Um, and, and I think even their primary care providers uh, are often 
thankful, you know, that they can come to the center, because this way they can get that up to the, you know, up to the minute uh, information, and we can actually help with lots of things. So sometimes there is a hesitancy uh, to participate in clinical trials. Patients may have that hesitancy, and we really try to work with that. We, you know, we're lucky, I think, in that we know our families really well. So patients that we know, we really try to kind of work with that uh, hesitancy. Uh, I think it's important uh, to, to recognize what the stumbling blocks are, to, to recognize what their hesitations are. Uh, for some people uh, with Huntington's disease, their days tend to be disorganized. It, it might be difficult for them to organize their days in such a way that they can get to the center, make it to the center. And they're pretty frank about that. So we need to know that. We need to ask those questions to find out what's limiting them. Uh, for other patients who are still working or trying to work or have a lot of obligations in their life, we need to know what, what their issue is. And, and uh, for some of them, it's taking time off from work. So we need to know that and we need to be prepared to help them with that, maybe by seeing them after hours or on a weekend. So those are the kinds of things that we need to do and we really try to. Some patients are concerned that if they ask for time off of work, their employer will start to wonder what's wrong and that this may reflect on them badly. So again, it's that same thing. We need to make that effort to make it look seamless for them or make it uh, after hours or on weekends so that they don't have to actually take time away from work. Some people have trouble just actually traveling to the center, getting there, and we need to help with that, and we, and we do, and I think most centers do. So, so clinical trial centers can help. You need to let them know what the issues are. Sometimes we will arri um, we'll arrange for a ride to the center for the patient. Um, we have um, uh, neighbors, for example, who've agreed to drive the patient to the center and, and then bring them home. Uh, and, and we've actually been able to help with the cost of all of that. So I think those are things to keep in mind. So if there is a stumbling block that you can identify, you know, tell the center because they can actually help you with that, uh, stum that specific stumbling block and make it easier for you.